Good morning, Mount Pleasant. Once again, God has blessed us to come together to study another great Sunday school lesson. Uh, we're still coming out of the book of Hebrews, another great lesson. So bow with me as we prepare to get into our lesson. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you, O Lord, for this opportunity and time once again that you've given us. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you, O Lord, for the beauty of creation and all that you have done for us in our lives. You've been so good to us in so many ways. You given us your word, O Lord, that we that can lead us, guide us, and strengthen us, O Lord, as we go through this way. And also we can find examples as we see and been seeing in our lesson, O Lord, of others who have gone on before us that we should learn to imitate, to keep the faith, and stay strong and be faithful unto the end. Continue, O Lord, to pour into us in our spirits all that you have for us, O Lord, that we may continue to grow in the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in every way, and prepare our hearts as we go into this lesson. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today will be coming again from the book of Hebrews. It's kind of following up from our last week's lesson, um, where we stopped off about the 11th verse, I believe it is, of the 12th chapter. We'll be picking up in the 18th verse, as far as our lesson is concerned, but we'll probably back up a few verses in order to uh, uh, be able to kind of get a full picture of what's going on. Certainly our title of the day is Faith Inspires Gratitude. And again, our lesson will be coming from Hebrews. Uh, the printed lesson is Hebrews 12th chapter, the 18th through the 29th verse. Uh, let's get into our lesson. The last week we kind of understood um, how the Hebrew writers help us to understand starting from the beginning, that we had to learn to lay aside every weight and, and sin that does beset us. And we understand Stuart God's chastening how he loves us. So as we look into our lesson today, we're going to see, uh, again, we're going to talk about the grace of God as we get into our lesson. And this is just something to help remind us of what was going on as we studied the book of Hebrews. The Jewish believers who received this letter were getting weary and wanted to give up. But the writer encourages them to keep moving forward in their Christian lives. Like runners on a track, he pointed out three divine resources that encourages a Christian to keep going when the situation gets difficult. The example, first is the, is the example of the Son of God. We see that in Hebrews 12 and 4. We talked about that last week. Second, the assurance of the love of God. Hebrews 12, 5, and 13. Again, we talked about most of that last week. But this week, we'll be talking about the enablement of God's grace. And we will see that in Hebrews 12, 14 through 29. And that's very important for us to understand how good God is to us, or God's grace is for us uh, as we walk this Christian journey. So as we look into this section, the writer encourages readers to depend on the grace of God by urging them to look by faith in three directions. First, to look back. And that would be uh, Hebrews 12 through 15, I mean 12, 15 through 17. Secondly, he asked them to look up, which is verses 18 through 24. And then he says to look ahead. Uh, which is 25 through 29. So these are the three areas that uh, the, that the uh, writer is encouraging them to do, the three directions in order for them to understand God's grace. First of all, to look back, to look up, and to look ahead. All right, let's look, even though this is not in our printed lesson today, but let's look at verse, start off at verse 15 through 17. And um, we can see what he's saying about how the grace of God it's upon us and how if we misuse it or abuse it, how we can actually lose it. And we're going to look at an example of Esau. Verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who was for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how the afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And we saw that when he came to his father Isaac, after Jacob had really gotten the blessing, 
Uh, but his father told him, there's nothing that's left for you. That's it. And we can see how we can lose out on so much in life if we just don't value the things that God give us, the grace of God uh, that comes to us in our life, much like Esau. So this is, as we look at this, this is the bad example of Esau that we don't want to we don't want to use or don't want to follow when it comes to the grace of God. Looking at these three verses, 15 through 17, as a grim reminder of what can happen among believers, the writer warned that one who misses the grace of God may be like a bitter root whose infidelity to God affects others. Here, the author had in mind Deuteronomy 29 and 18 where an Old Testament cover of apostate was called a root that produces such bitterness. Such a person, one who falls away back from God, would be godless, profane, unhallowed, or desecrated like Esau, Jacob's brother, whose loose and profane character led him to sell his inheritance right as the oldest son for the temporary gratification of a single meal. He warned the readers not to yield to transitionary pressure and forfeit their inheritance. If some did, they would ultimately regret their foolish step and might find the, their inheritance privileges irrevocably lost, as was Esau's. This would, of course, be true of anyone who ended his Christian experience in the state of apostasy, which the writer had continuously warned against. And like I said again, this is what Hebrews is all about. The writer is trying to help people to understand not to go back into the Mosaic law, but to stay in Christ because it was a far more superior way to live than trying to go back. And one of the biggest things, like he said, looking at verse 15 through 17, is that we don't want to be like Esau. We don't want to take lightly the grace of God and lose the things that are, that we're supposed to inherit or the things that God is supposed to give to us simply because we, we, we look at it as insignificant or very small. Like I say, for uh, a pot of stew, uh, Esau sold his birthright. And, he, and from that point, it just went down here from him because when I, I, uh, Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob instead of him. Of course, there was some trickery involved in that between uh uh, Rebecca, uh, the mother, as, and Jacob in fooling Isaac. Uh, but the point of it is Esau still lost the grace of God because he did not fully engulf what God had given him. And if we do that the same way today and lose the grace of God and not work or understand the grace of God, we too will lose a lot of our inheritance, just like Esau. So we don't want to follow the bad example of Esau when it comes to the grace of God, where we can lose all the things that God has in store for us. And again, what the writer is saying in Hebrew is, you don't want to walk this Christian journey and then at the end of it, go back and lose a lot of things that you could have if you uh, if you had not uh, had gone back and had continued in God. So we, we, we must understand that God's grace is very important for, for us in our life today. So let's look at the next direction uh, that the writer says, and this is in verses 18 through 24. And he says, look up the glory of the heavenly city. And this is the example of what he's saying here. Don't want to lose out on this. Don't want to lose out what God has for us. So he's going to contrast a little bit of the Old Testament with the new. So let's read verses 18 and 19 as we get into our lesson. And it says in verse 18, he says, but you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto dark blackness and darkness and tempest and the sounds of a trumpet and the voice of the words which the voice they that heard entreated that, uh, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. All right, let's read this a little bit differently from the New Living Translation, so we can kind of understand it a little bit better, because this is a picture of Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Uh, verse 18, and it says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, uh, that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged 
that no further word be spoken to them. And this is what, it, and so what is this? Let's go back and look at this. Uh, the writer Hebrew, as we look at verse 18 and 19, contrasts Mount Sinai and the giving of the law uh, with the heavenly Mount Zion and the blessings of the church. And we can see in uh, the examples of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, 10 through 25, 20, 18 through 21, and Deuteronomy uh, 4, 10 through 24. And let's read a portion of uh, Exodus, uh, the 20th chapter, 18 through 21, and you'll get an understanding of what I'm saying. This is what happened when they, when they got the first covenant at Mount Sinai. And all the people saw, and this is uh, uh, Exodus 20, 18, 18 through 21. And all the people saw the thunder, thundering and the lightning and the noise of the trumpets and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we shall hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you and, uh, and that his fear may be before your face that you said not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the, unto the thick darkness uh, where God was. So this was the scene at Mount Sinai, and this is what happened uh, at, the, at that time when they first got the first covenant, uh, went into, entered into the first covenant of God. But the Hebrew writer is, try, is still trying to help them understand the better blessing that we have through Christ. We didn't have to stand at the mountain right now. We didn't have to stand... Uh, uh, with all the smoking and crowd and, and, and the clouds and the lightning and the thunder and all the terror that was there. Um, the Hebrew writer described the sovereignty and the, even the terror that was involved in giving of the law. The people were afraid to hear God's voice. And that was the interesting thing. It was so dramatic at that particular point in time that the people were scared and uh, and, 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 and fear for their life because of what happened as we read into the lesson. But let's look at verses uh, 20 through uh, 21 and see what it says there. He says, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stone or thrust uh, with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly fear uh, and quake. So the, the scene was at Mount Pleasant, uh, at uh, Mount Sinai was the fact that uh, it was this. God set mountains. If you go back and look, and we wish we didn't read, but if you go back and look at Exodus 19, uh, 10 through 25, you'll see all the things that God did set. And one of the things that God set, as it says in verse 20, uh, was boundaries. He set, a, he set a boundary. He told Moses how far the people could come. And if anybody would go past that boundary, that they would be killed. And not only them, but even animals. That's why he says in verse 20, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast would touch the mountain, it shall be stone or thrust with a dart. So not, not even an animal would come. Why? Because God's presence was there, which represents the holiness of God. And you just can't come to God in any and every kind of way. So God set boundaries around the mountain. And even if an animal uh, trespasses, it was slain with a spear or a dot. Of course, of course, God had to impress upon his people the seriousness of his law, just as we must with our own children. This was the infantry of the nation, and the children can understand reward and punishment. And then the interesting thing about that, not only at Mount Sinai, the Bible tells us, and again, if you go back and read Exodus 10, um, uh, 19, I mean, Exodus 19, 10 through 25, just like verse 21 said, that even, it was so awesome uh, that even Moses was afraid. Look at verse 21 of, of Hebrews, and it says, so, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said that I am exceedingly fear and quake. So it even scared Moses because what God did on Mount Sinai, not only the people themselves, but Moses himself, that he was afraid, he was shaking because they understood the awesomeness of God and what God has done for them. But now let's let's look at um, what can happen to us as a result of living in God's grace. Let's look at verse 22. 
It says, but you have come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and an innumerable company of angels. What is what a release it is to move from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. Mount Sinai represents the old covenant of the law and Mount Zion represents the new covenant of the grace in Jesus Christ. See Galatians 4, 19 through 31. The heavenly city is God's Mount Zion. And we see that in Psalms 2 and then Psalm 110, 1 through 2 and 4. This is the city that the patriarchs were looking for by faith. The earth of the Jerusalem was about to be destroyed by the Romans, but the heavenly Jerusalem would endure forever. He described the citizens that make up the population of this city. It was an innumerable angels, and there were also other people. So we just come out of a, a beautiful um, lesson covering revelations in our last quarter's uh, readings, and we saw the beautiful things and the things and, and, and the the beings and the angels and all those, and even the saints that were going to be in heaven. So this is what, what, again, this is what the Hebrew writer is trying to contrast the old verses to new and showing all of us how great the new covenant under Christ is as opposed to going back to the law. So we must understand that we, if, we, if we go back, we give up so great. If we went back up in the law and never was saved, then we would never inherit the things that we talked about in Revelations of the New Jerusalem coming down and how the city was paved, streets were paved with gold, you know, uh, the foundations with the 12 apostles and all the things that, um, the names of the 12 apostles and, and all the things that the city offered to us and how beautiful it was and the mansions that was in it. We would give all that up if we would go back and do as the Hebrew readers of the recipients are about to do to go, turn around and go back into basically the world uh, under the uh, Mosaic law and follow that because we would never be saved. So this is what he's trying to say. We have a better way in Christ. Verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, what is he saying there? The church is there, first of all, because he's talking about to the general assembly. He say, for believers have their citizenship in heaven. We see that in Philippians 3 and 20. And the names are written in heaven. That's in Luke 10 and 20. So what does he mean by when he says the firstborn? He says, and the church of the firstborn. The firstborn is a title of dignity and rank. It may mean the assembly of those who inherit this rights are already won, since under the Old Testament law, the firstborn was primarily the heir. They have already gone on to heavenly regions where the angels are. And then it says, God the judge. But above all, but above all, it is to God, the judge of all men, that they have come. And there are some who indeed can stand the searching scrutiny of their lives. The spirits of the righteousness of men made perfect. So that's what he says in the, in the uh, last section of verse 23, that God is the judge, but it's okay because you have just men who have been made perfect or complete in Christ. So therefore we can, we can, we can endure the judgment of God or the things that we, we have to stand before God. But why? Because we're in Christ and all that has been taken care of for us uh, as we get before the judgment seat. And the spirits of just men made perfect are the Old Testament saints. Verse 24, as we look at this idea of understanding uh, uh, the second phase of, um, of, of, of the directions that we need to do, which is looking up to the heavenly city. So verse 24, and it says, verse 24 says, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling, that Abel, that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, what is we saying about this? It says, Jesus is the mediator. Verse 24, we're looking at. It says, of a new covenant, whose atoning blood does not cry for judgment as did Abel, but secures the acceptance of all new covenant persons. We learn that Abel is still speaking. We see that in, in Hebrews 11, 4, 
and here discovers that Christ's blood speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood spoke from the earth and cried for justice. We see that in Genesis 4 and 10. Why Christ's blood speaks from heaven and announces mercy for sinners. Abel's blood made Cain feel guilty and rightfully so and drove him away in despair. We see that in Genesis 4, 13 through 15. But Christ's blood frees us from guilt and has opened the way into the presence of God where it, where, were it not for the blood of the New Testament, we could not enter into this heavenly city. When the days are difficult, uh, when the days are difficult and we are having a hard time enduring, that is when we should look up and contemplate the glories of heaven. Moses endures as seeing him who is invisible. We see that in, in, in Hebrews eleven twenty seven. The patriarchs endured as they looked ahead to the city of God uh, was preparing for them. One way to lay hold on God's grace is to look ahead by faith to the wonderful future that he has prepared for us. And that's what we have to understand as believers is that all this is about faith. And we talked about this a lesson or two ago is that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So the Old Testament, how were the Old Testament saints saved? Because they didn't have what we call as Christ or salvation because they kept the faith and they always trusted God and they always look for the hope that God had promised them uh, always from the very beginning. So that's how they, they gain their salvation is through that faith and holding on and being able to, to, to walk faithfully through the end. We, we talked about Enoch uh, about a lesson or two ago. Enoch walked so close with God that he didn't even see death. He just was taken up one day and never seen again. That's, that's what it means because he was, the Bible said he, he was faithful. He believed God. And God took him because of his belief and, and his uh, and, and following what God asked him to do. And we did that in life, and we too will be able to understand and see the grace of God as well, too. Now, let's look at the last part of our lesson. And we want to look at uh, verses uh, 25 through 28, I mean, through 29. And this is the third direction that the Hebrew writer is asking us to look for when we want to hold on and not give up. He says to look ahead. So the three directions were at first was to look back. We don't want to be like Esau. To look up, look at the heavenly city and the things that God has promised to us. Now let's look at let's look ahead at the unshakable kingdom that God has promised for us. Verse 25, and it says, See ye that refuse not him that speaketh, but if they escape not who refuse him that speak on earth much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Uh, now, let's look at that, and let's read that in the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, now, excuse me, the NIV, and that way to give us a little bit better, clear understanding for verse 25. It says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? And this is something we need to understand. The contrast in verse 25, the contrast between two covenants is now focused as a contrast between a warning given on earth and one that is issued from heaven itself. God is speaking to us today through his word and his providential working uh, in the world. We had better listen. If God shook things at Mount Sinai and those who refused to hear were judged, how much more responsible are we today who have experienced the blessings of the new covenant? God today is shaking things. And the question is, have you paid attention to what's going on, uh, going on around the world today lately? Just think about it. How are we looking at it? We, we got wars in Europe. We got uh, floods here in the United States. We got fires. We got crime that's going out of control. We have a um, a virus that, that more than likely we're not going to ever get rid of. It's, it's just going to be here. 
and we have to learn how to live with it and to endure it and to do what we have to do in order to stay as healthy as possible. But we see these things are coming, but they shouldn't take us by surprise because Christ has already said to us uh, that these things would happen and that they would come. So therefore, um, uh, we should be expecting that. Uh, we should not be surprised, I should say, at the things that we're seeing because Christ has already predicted before the end of time that all these wars and pestilence and all these things that we are, we're experiencing, they will come. And we're seeing the very thing that Christ is talking about. Now, whether the virus was man-made or whether it was cut, however it came about, the point of it is, it's here. And it's something that we have to deal with. And it's something that we have to learn to understand that, again, I believe it's going to be with us throughout life. I mean, it's probably really never going to go away. It might be under control, but there are going to be some things that will still be here that we're going to have to deal with. So we have to understand God is shaking things up and God is helping us understand that what his word says is going to happen. He wants to tear down uh, the scaffolding and reveal the unshakable realities that, that are eternal. At last, too many people, including Christians, are building their lives on things that can shape. That's why it's so important for us to understand we got to stay connected and rooted and grounded in Christ. We can't allow this world to influence us or to take us in a direction that we don't need to go. Stay in Christ. And that's what he, that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. Stay in Christ to these to the to people who receive it. Stay in Christ because you don't want to go back because you've got so much that you're going to lose if you fall back out of Christ. God is shaking things up, but he's shaking things up because he wants us to understand uh, everything about him and that his word is true and that he's coming back. So we got to pay attention to, like I say, the signs of the time because if we pay attention and understand all that's happening, again, we shouldn't be surprised at what's going on. Verse 26 and verse 27. And he says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, yet once more, I would not, I shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. And this word, yet once more significance, the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now, again, let's read verse 26 and 27 of the NIV so we can get a little bit clearer understanding as to what is being said here. It says, at that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he, was, now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicated, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Now, what is he saying in, in, in that passage of Scripture? This divine voice, which once shook only the earth, but will un ultimately shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The reference to Haggai 2 and 6 was understood by the author as speaking of the ultimate remaking of the heavens and the earth, which would follow the millennium kingdom. And we see that in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. What remains after this cataclysmic event will be eternal. So there's going to be a lot of things happen. Again, go back through Revelation. We'll see a lot of things happen. But those things that, because uh, like I said, we're going to see a new heaven. We're going to see a new earth. Anything that was not, is not going to be permanent won't be there. It'll be taken away and we will have the new things that come in. <clears throat> So let's look at verse 28 and 29 as we close this out. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be removed. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a, what, a consuming fire. Verse 28 and 29 as we close this out. It says, and such is the character of the kingdom which we are receiving. The words, let us be thankful, may be rendered, let us have or attain grace. And I like to a final reference to the resources of grace available from the great high priest. This is confirmed by the words, and so 
literally, this is confirmed by the words, and so literally through which, which remind the readers that the, this grace is required in order to worship or better serve God as an ex, better serve God acceptably within the new covenant community. Failure to do so should be, be deterred by the including solemn thought that our God is a consuming fire. A believer who departs from his magnificent privileges will invite God's uh, retribution. God is only going to be patient uh, but for so long. Then the things that were said to happen would happen. Ultimately, eternal damnation. So we have to understand that we don't take God's grace seriously and do the things that God has laid out for us. Uh, then ultimately, there will come a time when we uh, will face uh, the judgment of God. Many people like think God is, is just a loving God who won't hurt, who won't do things. But God has his point. And when that point has been reached, we all, we who have not been faithful or we who have not uh, received Christ as Lord and Savior, we will receive the just judge, judgment and punishment that God said that would happen to all those who didn't. <clears throat> Note this as we close this lesson out. It says, what shall we do as we live in a shaken world? First of all, we listen to God speak and obey him, receiving grace day by day to serve him with reference and godly fear. Do not be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you today. Keep running the race with endurance. Keep looking ahead to Jesus Christ. Remember that your father loves you and draws, and draws on God's enabling grace while others are being frightened. You can be confident. And this is what we need to learn to understand. Stand in Christ is always the best way. And if we understand the grace of God, we will understand how blessed we will be by doing the things that we do. Hopefully something was said today, as I always like to say, uh, that will continue to encourage you, enlighten you, instruct you, and keep us in this straight and narrow path. And until we have this blessed opportunity to come back together again, if it be God's will, you take care and be blessed in Christ. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.